Hello, and welcome to Sobercast. We provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in a podcast format. We are an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting Sobercast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into the virtual basket. Also, if you're a member of NA or have friends that are, please tell them about our other podcast, NAPOD. NAPOD features NA speakers and workshops in the same format as Sobercast. We upload a new speaker every day, and it's easy to subscribe by searching for NAPOD, N-A-P-O-D, all one word, on any podcast player app, or go to NAPOD.XYZ if you'd like to listen online. Hope you enjoy the podcast and have a great day. As we were coming into an anteroom off stage this afternoon, Your speaker turned to me and said, I want to talk with you, and he made it very emphatic. And as we sat in the ante room, he turned to me and said, Al, don't give me any flowery introduction. Keep it simple, please. And he mentioned those wonderful, wonderful uh, words of our traditions, let's keep principles above personalities. I understood that this man had a four-hour talk, but what he didn't reckon with was the fact that he had an editor who was going to be up here with him who has the sharpest blue pencil in history. And I wasn't about to let him get away with it, but the air service took care of that. He has a plane leaving at six o'clock so we can be assured to get out of here by sundown. Back in 1939, shortly less than four years after AA was born, there was a little group formed over in Cleveland, Ohio, and there our speaker of today was given by God's grace sobriety through a very young and infant Alcoholics Anonymous. We owe a a deep debt of gratitude to those who have come before and have carried the message to us who were suffering. And I feel that gratitude very deeply this afternoon. Among the first 100 men to enter AA was your speaker, who then was a resident of Cleveland. His home now is in San Mateo, California. It is with pleasure and indeed an honor that I present to you at this time your speaker of the day, Dewey S., one of the first hundred. Dewey? Happy anniversary. A happy anniversary to all of you. My name is G. Dewey and the G in my name is anonymous. <clears throat> <clears throat> I'm truly sorry about this plan of mine leaving ahead of time. I'm not going to be able to give the four hour talk, but I'll give you all I can. Talk as long as I can. You can be sure of that. Uh, before I came into Alcoholics Anonymous, <clears throat> I could talk fluently on quite a variety of subjects, including baseball, football, deep sea fishing, big game hunting, what have you, air space uh, space travel, that sort of thing. Uh, I could uh, (coughs) I could have told you about the with uh, by using the maximum amount of imagination and the minimum amount of truth. I could tell some really interesting stories. I could have told you about the time I struck out Ty Cobb four times in one game. I could have told you about my days in football when I was a star, when I stopped men like Johnny Malbets, Willie Heston, and Tom Harmon dead in their tracks. 
And um, I got a thrill here with my own personal experiences in space travel. Because long before the world ever heard of Sputnik, I'd been in orbit many, many times. <laughs> <laughs> and I never had to use a rocket for it. <clears throat> I didn't get started, uh, I, of course, now since I'm in Alcoholics Anonymous, I limited somewhat. I hope you appreciate that. I'm limited to telling one story about what, what I was like, and what happened, what I'm like now. And the uh, ethics of uh, the fellowship insists that I stick to the maximum of truth and minimum imagination. Now, uh, I'm not going to bore you with a lengthy blow-by-blow -blow discussion of my drinking power, uh, career, but I think I should tell you enough, really to assure you, that this is not amateur's day in any sense of the word. Uh, <clears throat> I didn't get started on my drinking career as early as some. When I was about 13 years old, my favorite uncle died of acute, of acute alcoholism. He was my buddy and my pal. When he passed on, I was heartbroken. And for a long time after that, I regarded alcohol as the very essence of evil. And because of his untimely passing, I didn't uh, do very much drinking unless I finished my formal education. My own immediate family was another reason for my slow start. In the Spees family, we had a law that was just as rigid as any of the laws in the Medes and Persians. On Sunday, you went to the services of your church, period. As soon as we were able enough, we were wrestled off to Sunday school. And as soon as we were housebroken, we stayed. For, we were, had to stay for church. That meant there were two or three services on Sunday, one or two during the week. And then my father was a very active man in the church. They used to say of him that he was everything but the minister and the janitor, and he was very generous with my time. I got to tend the furnace in the wintertime, and sometimes I could pump the pipe organ or ring the bell. I used to mow the lawn for the minister and run errands for the congregation. By the time I was 18 years old, I had enough church to last me the rest of my life. I was looking forward to the time when I could graduate from high school and go away from home and get in the job and live the kind of life I wanted to live. But about the time I was ready to graduate, some nosy person in the relationship started to investigate the family tree, and they came up with this, that there were, never had been a, a minister in the Spies family, and there should be, and I was it. <laughs> you know, everybody was wildly enthusiastic about this thing but me, and, and I rebelled as much as I could. But at that particular time, my father was physically fit, and he was used to having his own way. And more, and more important, he was bigger than I was. So I consented to go to the seminary. I say consent in the broadest sense of the word. When I got away from home, I had a chance to think for myself. And after a year in the seminary, I was faced with the most serious problem in my life. I've always believed in God, believed in Jesus Christ. But I have never been able to believe all of the theology they woven around the life of Christ. Now my problem was this. Shall I go on and continue and become a minister, going out and preaching something I don't believe all my life and then go to hell as a hypocrite? Or shall I come flat out and tell them I don't believe and go to hell as an unbeliever? I chose the latter. <laughs> and I'm going to tell you right now that I gave the clergy the best break they ever had in their lives when I quit and went down to study metallurgy. <clears throat> When I finished with my formal education, I was able to get a job in the research laboratory of a nationally known steel corporation. I didn't drink very much there for the first two or three years. But during those two or three years, I fell in love with the steel business. And I knew if I were going to mount any of the steel business, I would have to get down on the plant and get some experiences in melting and rolling steel. So I asked for a transfer, and they gave me a job in the open heart department. Now, to those of you who are not familiar with steel mill work, I want to say this. But regardless of what you may have read in the Saturday Evening Post, there's damn little glamour in the steel business. You do your work, or you did it at that time, with a, cl a crowbar and a shovel and a wheelbarrow and a sledge. It was brutally hot work and terribly hard work. <clears throat> and uh, down there in that mill, they had a slogan. If you want to make good steel, you've got to learn to drink good whiskey. And if you want to sell steel, you've got to learn to hold your whiskey. At the time I worked in the open hearth, 
A non-drinking man was about as just about as common as a lush at a WCTU picnic. <clears throat> well, I worked in the open north for about ten years and drank ten years. I had a lot of fun, I thought. I made a lot of money, spent a lot of money, and it didn't seem to hurt me a bit. I started my second decade. Still promotions and more money, which meant more drinking. And eventually this cost me my job. But the luck of the alcoholic was on my side. I wasn't out of work very long when I was named liquidating manager of a bank, a higher salary, and I received the steel plant. Unfortunately for me, my interpretation of the word liquidation was entirely different than the bank's interpretation. <laughs> and uh, about a year after that, I was out reading the help, help ads. I got planted two more jobs, and I lost them. Things were going a little rough, and I couldn't understand it. The, the crash of 1929, the stock market crash, broke me completely. My wife had divorced me and taken two children away from me. My mother had died, and my drinking was becoming a serious problem. I couldn't understand it. One day I sat down and tried to figure out what was wrong, what to do about it. And I came up with a very brilliant conclusion. I concluded that it wasn't my fault that I was going out and getting drunk. At least these lousy bums I was associating with, those were the fellows who were getting me drunk. Now then, I'll go away. Somewhere where the sky is blue and the grass is green and the air is pure, and I'll start life all over again. So I started on a ten-year geographic cure. <clears throat> now the fallacy of an alcoholic taking a geographic cure is simply this. John Barleycorn walks in your foot in your shadow, and John Barleycorn is cunning, baffling, and powerful. And Doctor said, Dobb said one time, we might have added the word patient to that too. At any rate, <clears throat> I had a, I followed a sort of a pattern at first. I go out and get a job, and never had any trouble getting employment. I get a job, and I worked like the very devil for about the first ten weeks, and we began to attract some attention. And I stayed home at night in my room. I didn't crowd around. But you know, a fellow can't sit around in the lobby of the YMCA reading the ladies' home journal all the time, you know. There comes a time when you you crave companionship, and I knew where to find it. It was down at the bar. And just about the time the boss was ready to promote me, my newly found companions and I were out on a vendor, and I got fired, and then I had to go to another town and start all over again. I think of those of that ten-year period as the most terrible period of my life, a period that was dotted with jails, cheap boarding houses, sanitariums, mental institutions. Days of associating with inferior people, days of remorse, shame, and regret. Days when I lost my respect for God and lost my respect for my fellow man and for myself. And by the time I finished that ten-year geographic cure, I was right down on the bottom. I was a bankrupt in every phase in life. I think I could best be described as saying that I was a rimless zero on the debit side of the ledger of life. And if I am anything above that rimless zero today, I owe it to God and to Alcoholics Anonymous and to my non-alcoholic wife who inspired me to put AA above every other project in my life. And uh, I'll forever love her in respect to that. My, uh, this ten-year geographic uh, cure trip came to an abrupt end one day at Christmas Day, down east, down at the Valley Forge Hotel. I was a periodic drinker, a periodic in my drinking, and I was having one of my better periods. I was living in a hotel, and I had a job at a local steel plant. Christmas came along, and I was feeling very sorry for myself because I didn't have any home or family to go to. So I called up Al down the bar and told him to send up three-fifths of Grandad. And he told me he couldn't spare it. And I put in quite an argument. I told him I'd spend a lot of money there. I thought I ought to have it. And he finally broke down because I told him I was going to have a very important party up there. And he sent it up all right. The only thing I neglected to tell him about the party was that I was the only one invited. And I'm not too sure just all what all went on that day. I must have had a wonderful session with the telephone because when I got my bill, it looked like the national vet. But late in the afternoon, a fellow who knew I was in that room called me and asked me how I was getting along, and I developed the hiccups so violently they were affecting my heart, and I couldn't talk. He called the manager. The manager called the hospital, and they rushed me off. 
Several days afterwards, when the fog lifted, my doctor came in and sat down on the bed beside me. A little short, squat fellow, sort of a perverted sense of humor, I thought. And he told me, he flat out, that my drinking career had come to the crossroads. He says, here's your bottle, and off here's your graveyard, and over here's sobriety and life. He said, you're not very well acquainted around this little town here, are you? I said, no, I'm not. He said, well, you know, uh, Speedy, we have a hell of a nice little graveyard out here at the edge of town. He says, I have you going up over the tombstones, and some nice big pine trees out there, and there's a lot of old revolutionary heroes buried out there. And you're working for a responsible company, and if you want to drink, he said, I think they'll plant you out there at no cost to you or your family, and walked out. Well, gentle officer, he jolted me right down to my heels. Nobody ever talked like that to me before, and I was really down. I was really scared. Well, that is for at least ten minutes, anyway. And then I, <clears throat> I began to figure, well, that old fogey's just trying to scare me the same as all the rest of them. But I wasn't too sure, because he sounded pretty convincing. And just then, an elderly nurse came through, and I talked to her about it. She said, well, I don't believe you realize how close you came to dying of night when you were in here. So as much as I like to live, I like, as much as I like to drink, I like to live better. So I decided I would quit for a while. I had this in mind. I drank like a gentleman for ten years after coming out of school. Now then, if I lay off this stuff for about a year, a year and a half, and give Mother Nature a chance to rebuild my system, or to put a little more bluntly, to put a new lining in my stomach. There's no reason why I still can't drink like a gentleman. And that's what I had in mind. I started out. It was a terrible period. I was out of a job. I didn't know what to do. I was bitter. I was feeling terribly sorry for myself. I, I couldn't understand the injustice of life. I had brothers that could drink and didn't bother them a bit. Why did this happen to happen to me? I'd go out on the club car of a train, and I'd sit there. The fellows would be enjoying their drinks, and I'm stuck in a lousy bottle of ginger ale. Do any of you know how it is? <laughs> and there I'd go out in the hotel at night in the dining room, and the lights were low, and the women were fair, and the whiskey smelled good, and I'd sit there with this lousy bottle of ginger ale. <laughs> but all things have to come to an end, I guess, so finally one day I received a letter offered me a position in New York in the Export Steel Sales Division of the same company that fired me some ten years before that. Well, I recognized this as an opportunity to come back. And I promised myself that uh, I wasn't going to drink with anybody but my customers. And that proved to be a mistake because I soon began to get too many customers. <laughs> now, that brings us up to the winter of 1938-39. Out in Akron, Ohio, in Hank Williams' home, there was a group of men meeting there who were later to become known as Alcoholics Anonymous. And in that group, there were some 12 men from Cleveland, Ohio, and they were talking to the rumor going of separation. They were planning from the group to start a group of their own in Cleveland. And Dr. Bob knew of this. He wasn't opposed to it. But he didn't think the group as a whole was quite mature enough to make a complete break. Nevertheless, these men took the bull by the horns, and early in 1939, they started this group. <clears throat> now, at that particular time, there was another rumor of separation floating around our office that affected me more seriously. <clears throat> and one day it happened. <clears throat> the old man called me in, and he said, Speed, I think you have a brilliant drinking career ahead of you. And he thought it was a shame to have anything as prosaic as a job more of that drinking career. And he told me he was going to arrange a separation for me, for my company, so that I might devote 100% of my time to drinking instead of only 95%. <laughs> so I'm out of a job. I don't know what to do. So I did what an alcoholic does when he doesn't know what to do. I went out and got drunk. And then something happened. I might have called it a coincidence at the time, but as years passed on, and I'm sure it isn't, I don't think I had very much to do with it. I think it was probably the answer to somebody's prayers. Because six weeks after I was fired in New York, I was a district sales manager of an industrial chemical company in Cleveland, Ohio. And I didn't want to go to Cleveland. When they asked me how much money I wanted, I thought I'd set them back in their heels, and I asked for about twice as much of the job as worth, I thought, and they met it. I didn't know anything about the chemical business, excepting as a layman. And there I am, in the city I didn't want to go to, and the city I didn't know a job I didn't know very much about. But this job paid off very well from the very start. It was just very fortunate to be the right man in the right place. It wasn't due to any particularly great salesmanship on my part. 
When I got to Cleveland, I was able to find a place to live in the home of a very wealthy lady who thought I was a perfect gentleman because I didn't drink. Of course, I did miss out on telling her some of the little details that she probably found out later. Well, this job put me in good standing with myself. I thought the world was mine now, and everything was going fine for about at least five or six weeks. And then I began to get depressed feelings. I'd get terribly blue and depressed, and I thought everybody was talking about me, and the boss didn't appreciate it. Nobody cared for me, and so on. And nothing was further from the truth because I, things were going better now than they had gone for a long time. I'd go home at night and I'd begin to think of my children and I couldn't go into my room. I'd have to walk out and walk till I was tired before I could go to sleep. It got so bad I finally had to go to a doctor. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> this doctor examined me very carefully. When he finished, he told me there was nothing organically wrong with me, excepting that I had a little low blood pressure. That was the cause of my despondency. And then he asked me point blank, blank. he said, do you, do you drink speed? And I said, certainly not, the idea. And so uh, he told me to go get a uh, bottle of good brandy. And every night before I had my dinner, take one stiff drink, and that's all, one drink a day. Well, up to that particular time, I didn't have too much use for the doctors, because they knew me too well, they knew too much about me. But here was a hell of a nice guy, here was a guy, I really liked him. So. <laughs> You know, he, he, was, he had a lot of good common sense, this fellow. So I burned the rubber off my heels getting down to the store to get this bottle of brandy. And I did that little thing for a week, uh, one drink before I had my dinner in the evening. Of course, I didn't want to cheat myself. My drink amounted about that much in a water glass. <clears throat> and by that time, that was kicking out. I got up to the restaurant, that was kicking around, the world began to look rose tinted again. Well, the next week, I started playing around with nightcaps. I would get into bed and get a book. And I'd take a great big slug, and i just ooze off in sleep, and it was wonderful for a couple of nights. Finally, one day, I met a man on the street, and he says, uh, how about having a glass of beer with me? Well, you know, heck, beer, beer never hurt anybody, so okay. When he went in, he said, how about a shot? And I said, well, now I'll make it a little shot. All right. You see, I've got this thing under control, now, and I'm not going to get drunk. So we went in, and we had a shot and a beer, and then we had a beer and a shot, and then we had a shot and a beer. And three weeks later, the old lady who thought I was a perfect gentleman was trying to find some way of getting me out of that house without calling the cops. And then another strange thing happened. My landlady was a rel religious lady. She didn't drink. And there were only 12 of these alcoholics in the city of upwards of three-quarters of a million people. But she had a brother living down, worked downtown in an office, and he had a sister. <clears throat> and his sister had a a boyfriend, and his boyfriend had an uncle who was a friend of relation of one of the way around the bush to one of these fellows. It was nothing like that. And that's how I contacted, made my first contact with the A. And I stands out in my mind very vividly. It was on Sunday afternoon, too, by the way. I'd been in my room all day long, <clears throat> and uh, I wasn't, uh, I was stretched across the bed for the simple reason I was too drunk to stand up. And I wasn't alone in my room. There was a minister Susan Band in the room. These, band, these fellows were about that high. They had black beards and red uniforms and shiny instruments. They marched out from underneath my bed, up over the bed, down and these round and around it. And they kept on, kept, they were playing the stars and stripes forever and ever and ever and ever. And, ever and, ever. and I'll tell you that I never heard that, place, that piece played like that before nor since. And I hope to God I never do, because... Uh, you know, after the four or five hours of the Stars and Stripes forever, it begins to taste of the keg. <clears throat> they were still marching when my rap came to the door, and before I could answer the door, in stepped the Holy Roller himself, and he introduced himself. He said he understood that I had a drinking problem, and he would talk to me about A if I wanted to. Well, first I knew he was a square as soon as he mentioned the drinking problem, because I had a case of Grandad alongside of my bed. When I wanted to drink, all I had to do was reach down and grab a bottle. It was no problem, and I told him so. <laughs> <laughs> and in my, in my wildest drunken imagination, I couldn't figure out what an automobile club had to do with cutting out drinking. I told him about that, too. <laughs> what a patient fellow he must have been. Well, he started to talk. And he talked, and could he talk, and did he talk? I think he was vaccinated with some kind of recording needle because he just kept on talking. <laughs> and I was hoping he would stop because I was due for a drink, and I didn't want to drink in front of him because he talked as if he might be a minister. And he kept on talking, and I finally passed out. 
And the next morning I wake up, I was in a nursing home south of Cleveland. And two fellows were talking out in the hall, and they said some horrible things. They said, in AA, it's total sobriety for the rest of your life. And my chin dropped from there down to here. As soon as they left, I put on my robe and my slippers, and there was a payphone down about the hall, down about a mile. And I finally made it that morning. And I got a hold of this fellow toward me the night before, and I said, now look, I know I'm drinking too much, and I'm willing to do something about it, but as it hell's bell, let's not go all over board of this thing, you know. I said, what do you do at Christmas time or New Year's Eve or when you go back for the homecoming game? He says, we don't drink. Well, I thought, well, all right, perhaps you could do it, but what would be the purpose of living if you couldn't have a little fun? And that was my attitude toward AA. When I got well, got out of the hospital and leave, I, my, my sponsor was a very nice chap. He'd gone out of his way to take care of me, and I felt that I owed him the courtesy of <coughs> going to meetings with him. So I went to half a dozen. With no intention of joining that ever. I just went as an observer. And at that particular time, I had a, a pretty exaggerated opinion of my own intelligence. In the first meeting, I had it all figured out. I was about 40 years old, and these men were 50, 55, 60, and they looked even older because of the drinking. Now, they weren't kidding me a doggone bit. It wasn't AA who was bringing common sense to these fellas. It was just the lack of strength to raise hell. <laughs> <clears throat> and I felt that I had some strength left. <laughs> so after about four or five meetings, or six meetings, maybe seven, I decided that this might be all right for some for alcoholics, but since it was for alcoholics, it didn't affect me. Now, I have a story that fits in there, and if you heard it, please don't stop me. I still like to tell it. This has to do with two soldiers who were up to their physical examination before they were discharged. Doc noticed on the cheek of one there was a perfect likeness of the skull, very size, same size and shape. And he asked him whether he'd gotten that in the service. The chap said no. He said when his mother was pregnant with him, about three months before he was born, she developed a, one, uh, an intense appetite for strawberry. She ate all she could. She dreamed strawberries, talked strawberries, and when he was born, that strawberry appeared on his cheek. Well, the next chap came up for his examination. The doc said, what do you think of that guy's idea? Ah, that guy's nuts. He said, you take my own case. About three months before I was born, my mother went downtown one Saturday afternoon and went to the music store. And she bought a book of records. And as she left the store, she slipped on the icy sidewalk and she fell. And she broke every one of those records. But it didn't affect me, it didn't affect me, it didn't affect me, it didn't affect me, it didn't affect me. <laughs> Just as silly as that fellow was. Here I was. Here I had A right in the palm of my hand. And I tossed it away because it didn't affect me. I quit going to meetings. Fortunately for me, only a few weeks later, I put on the bender to end all benders. I picked up a touch of the flu. Incidentally, flu is my favorite disease. I had 17 varieties of it, and I used every one of them. Nervous breakdowns were next, and of course, then I always had a case of tomaine poisoning for emergency. <clears throat> But I had gone to bed, and I had my grand case of grand outside of me, and I drank there for nine days. I was nursing this flu very carefully. I didn't want to get well too soon because I liked the treatment. <clears throat> but at the end of the ninth day, I really thought I had had it. I thought I was going to die. And I'm not kidding about that. I thought I was had made, <clears throat> made the grade. I sat there that, or lying in bed that morning, and uh, I couldn't keep the drinks down. I couldn't keep anything down. That morning, I looked at that bottle over there in the dresser, a half-filled bottle. And the thought occurred to me that all the real troubles of my life somehow or other I could trace right down in the neck of that bottle, my financial troubles, my domestic troubles, my job troubles, my troubles of getting along with my neighbors and so forth. When I wasn't drinking, I wasn't in trouble, or if I did have trouble, I faced it. And I got the feeling that morning that a man who professed to be as smart as I thought I was ought to have enough sense to quit kicking himself around. I've been over backwards all my life, and A, never to speak as one with authority, because I don't think I'm qualified to speak with authority. But I think that's the feeling we must have, that we want this thing for ourselves and for ourselves alone without any outside pressure. But what to do? I tried everything else, I thought. <clears throat> and <clears throat> then I thought, I remembered that, uh, that there was uh, an AA, a fellow got into AA, and I thought he was worse drunk than I was, and he seemed to be doing pretty well. It occurred to me that... Maybe I missed the boat. And uh, uh, 
Maybe I'd better give this thing another look. So I went down to the nursing home again in my own steam. A day or two later, when I was able to talk sensibly, I got up, went down, and I got a hold of the fellow that had charge of the place. And I said, Bill, I want you to tell me about this AA program you start. And he laughed at me. He said, remember, Speed, you were down here about three or four weeks ago. You were telling us how to run the program, remember? Uh, so I was. You see, I had read the book, and I thought there was parts of it that sounded pretty good. This thing might work if you'd get uh, somebody in, say, some oh, little promotional ideas in there, a little tend toward literary, and rewrite this book, take a lot of the God stuff out of it, and uh, instead of total sobriety, uh, drop some sort of middle-of-the-road pause there. Let the fellows drink a little beer once in a while. Of course, not on meeting nights or anything like that, but uh, once in a while, you know. And sometime, uh, or, uh, somehow or other, the idea didn't seem to go across. Well, I said, Bill, I'll thank you if you'll forget that. And I'll never forget how kindly that fellow was after taking all my lip a few weeks before. He sat down there and told me about AA, and this is what he said. He said, AA is a spiritual, <coughs> a spiritual fellowship. And we get spiritual help to rest our alcoholism if we live in such a way as to deserve it. And he said it was, when he said it was spiritual, like infused with religious, and I felt the hair beginning to curl up in my back again. He assured me it was a spiritual program. And he laid out a little plan for me. He suggested in the mornings, before I go down to the office, out on the job, that I would spend a little time on meditation and prayer, asking for help to stay sober that day, and then that night to express my gratitude in prayer. Well, he said, that's the way we do it, a day at a time. And that was the first thing that I grudgingly admitted sounded like pretty fair, pretty good common sense. I thought well, I could stay sober a day at a time. It didn't sound nearly as long as the rest of your life. But when he said prayer, I, I was up against it. I couldn't pray. I, I had no faith in prayer. I had no faith in God, man, or anything else. I remember the first time I was in jail. I remember the Sunday school lesson about the early Christians, how... To somehow through their prayers or their friends that they, the locks dropped off and they walked out of the cell three persons. That night I prayed like a son of a gun. And no lock fell off. In fact, I'll tell you, I never prayed to lock off a jail door in my life. Never once. They always had to come down with $10 in cost or I stayed there. So I didn't have any faith in prayer. And I used to, when I'd go broke, I used to pray for a pocketbook with $60 in it. Don't ask me why it wasn't 70 or 40 I can't tell you. But I know that I never found more than two bits in my life. And I was going to tell him that I couldn't go along with the prayer idea. The truth of the matter was simply this. I didn't have the guts to pray. When I walked out of that seminary that morning, <clears throat> I, I turned my back on God. And I kept the turn on him all these years. I dug the hole for myself. I got right down to the bottom of this hole. And then I thought, to ask God then, after look, turning on my back on him for all these years, it would be a sacrifice. But I made a decision. I decided I had to do something. I would go into AA and I would do everything they told me to do, mechanically if necessary. I felt that I had everything to gain and nothing to lose, and I was sure of this. They couldn't make a worse mess out of life I made out of myself. And that's how I got started in the AA. I, went, I started back to the meetings. And I recall the first meeting. I sat on my hands to keep my hands from shaking off. At the end of the meeting, Dr. Bob came over and said, what do you think of it? I said, well, I'm confused. I, I, I feel as if I'm a kid starting the school again. He said, well, in the sense, that's about what you're doing. He said, AA is an institution of learning. It's a little different than most. He said, in AA, there's no provision made for the teacher, for the pupils to graduate. And there's no provision made for the instructors to retire. He said, we're both the student and the teacher. And he, that night, I learned from Dr. Bob that it was just as important to learn as it was to teach, and it was just as important to pray as it was to preach. And Dr. Bob told me to stay with this thing. Stay with the fellows that know about it, to learn what you can, and follow out, and you'll, you'll be all right. And his parting shot to me was this. He said, don't take your algebra before you finish your arithmetic. I interpreted that to mean that I should take first things first. Well, those were pretty rough days. I didn't realize at the time how alcohol had ruined my mind. At one time when I was going to school, I could memorize almost as fast as I read. Now I find myself repeating in conversation. I can't remember what I did yesterday afternoon. I find myself double-talking to myself. I didn't realize I was that bad off. 
I was confused. I heard things in the meetings I didn't like, things I didn't understand. And I still hear things in meetings that I don't understand, that I don't like too well. But I have the privilege of taking what I want and setting the rest aside for reference. And during these terrible days of confused period, when I was trying so hard to get this program, because I needed it so bad, these few words came to me, must have been in my subconscious mind for a long time. When I was a youngster, I used to pump a pipe organ in the church, and I got a half a dollar Sunday for it. I never paid any particular attention to what the minister said, because I was trying to be busy figuring out what I'd buy with a half a dollar. And then one day he said, when you pray, give us this day our daily bread. <clears throat> be sure your tablecloth's clean, and then you'll get your daily bread. And then in a flash, something hit me. I knew then and there why I had never gotten any help from prayer, because my table wasn't talk was clean. And I knew that if I expected God to help me with my sobriety, I was going to have to start cleaning my tablecloth. Now at that particular time, I thought the only thing that was wrong with me was that I drank too much. But when I started to clean up, I found a lot of things wrong. I've been cleaning at that tablecloth now for a matter of 26 years, 25, 26 years, and there's still spots on it. And perhaps it's just as well. Because if I had the thing clean really white in 15 years, I doubt very much whether I had the incentive to go on. But as long as there's spots on that tablecloth, I'm going to be active in AA. <clears throat> and I've learned some things through those years of cleaning my tablecloth. I learned that there's a direct, a direct relation between the quality of my sobriety and the kind of life I'm living. And I've learned that I get help from God in direct proportion to the amount of effort I put forth keep my tablecloth clean. And that was a satisfying feeling. Now I began to pray and began to mean something. I kept on going to meetings for probably three or four more weeks, and finally one Sunday morning, things seemed to happen on Sunday with me, I got a, I got a, a call and they asked me to make a 12-step call. This fellow was, had been a, a chap from West Virginia, he'd been drinking since he was 13 years old. <clears throat> he saw a new, an ad in the New York paper and he wrote in and asked for help and they reached so they had sent the call back, and I got it. I started out that Sunday morning. It was zero weather. And I finally found this man, his wife, and little boy, all living in one room, the most terrible, uh, poverty-stricken place you ever saw in your life. When I got there, she had the grips back, and she was ready to leave. And the little boy was in the corner crying, because every time he turned around, he'd get beat up. And the husband was sitting on the bed, shaking it out. I finally got her quieted down, and she agreed to give him one more chance. Then I went over to talk to the boy, and he quit crying. Then I went over to talk to the man, and I was scared. This was my first call, and I was nervous, and I talked to him. I don't know what I said to him. I'm sure he didn't know either. But he did follow me to the door, and he said, Can you come back tomorrow? And I said, I'll be back. And I was back the next day, and the next day, and the next day. This was my kitten. I'm going to have him. And he finally got through the shakes and started back to work again. And then, in about three months' time, I saw the whole marvelous miracle of AA <clears throat> unfold right before my very eyes. I went down there about three weeks later, and she came to the door all excited, and she showed me the first industrial paycheck she'd ever seen. And she was all excited and out of breath. She said, he gave, me, gave this to me and told me to handle the money from now on in. She was beginning to get some of the things out of the AA. About two weeks later, I went down, and the little boy came out, and he put on a little pair of shoes <clears throat> and a top coat and romper suit. He looked at my eyes and said, uh, my dad got these for me, mister, and I ain't scared of them anymore. And then for the first time, I realized how many people we hurt other than ourselves when we drink. You know, I had a boy and a girl. No doubt I hurt them the same way. It hurts even how to talk about it. But about three months passed, and the chap called me up and told me they had moved. Come on down. I went down. And uh, I stood there on the porch and was looking the place over. It wasn't a palace or a mansion. It was a cottage. It was a nice, clean place. They had curtains and drapes to windows, bang carpets on the floor. And out in the kitchen, there was a nice, shiny refrigerator when there was on. There was, honest to God, food in it. Instead of that loaf of bread and that half bottle of milk that they'd been eating that morning at the moon when I called them. And this chap was sitting at the table helping the boy with these lessons. <clears throat> and the wife was... Was sewing, listen to the radio, and they thought a mar modern miracle happened. This chap hadn't had a drink for three months. And when I stood on the porch and watched those people at night, <clears throat> I, I never saw happiness shine out of people's eyes like the happiness shone out of their eyes. 
And that night I became an AA, in fact. Of that time I was just enrolled. Because I had some doubts in my mind. I had been lived a pretty rotten life. And I wondered whether it would be worthwhile me at this, at this age to go to the bother of trying to stay sober the rest of my life. I thought people would always remember me as that no good so-and-so, and they always remember the things that I did and so on. But this night there seemed to be a little patch of blue in the sky. And I thought perhaps if I could forget my troubles, forget myself, and start to bring, try to bring a little happiness in the lives of other people, maybe I could be people. And it worked out very beautifully for me. Not long after the Saturday evening Post articles came out, people began to come into Cleveland by the droves to find out what this AA is all about. And for about a year and a half, from every war, every moment of my spare time, including my vacations and some of the company's time, we spent to showing these fellows around and telling them what little we knew about AA, <coughs> uh, which wasn't very much. But uh, as the fellow said, the one fellow said later on, you fellows, you didn't have to tell very much. He said, we could see by the enthusiasm of your face and the satisfaction you had something that we wanted us. And that, those were hard, those were pretty strenuous days. We worked all the time, and, uh, but it was a happy, <coughs> happy uh, job to have, wonderful job to have because we were happy in it. And I would go through it all again because I, I, I still remember with the greatest, uh, fondest memory of those days when we worked. And I've never been quite as happy, I don't think, as when I was busy with AA. Now things are going pretty good. I've sponsored a man, and I'm, I'm sober myself, I have work to do. And uh, the respect of this uh, fellow that I sponsored, uh, making a go of this thing, it had affected me something like a salesman who had to get a big order the first time he was out. And that's the way it affected me. And I went into AA tooth, hammer, and tong, and, and worked at it and enjoyed every bit of it. But I had one fly in the ointment. From the time I came into AA, I heard people tell about their wonderful uh, spiritual experiences in AA. They were marvelous things. And you know, I never had any. I never, I never felt, heard any angel wings flooding over my shoulders, and I was disappointed. And I remember Bill's story. He told us to it several times about when he was in the hospital and he got out of his bed on his knees to pray. And all of a sudden, the lights in the room flared up into a dazzling brilliance of white light. He thought, felt, imagined he was way off in a hill somewhere and the wind was cleansing his body and soul. And then he thought he was really scared. He thought he was losing his mind. And when Dr. Silkworth came back in the room, he asked him about it. And the doc had been a less sympathetic, tolerant man and said, yes, Bill, you're nuts. We probably wouldn't have any A today. But he was good enough to tell Bill, whatever you have, stick to it. And or stick or hang with it. So I'd go home at night. I'd flop down to the board and I'd watch our old-fashioned chandelier. I watch it and watch it and watch it. You know, nothing ever happened. Oh, once in a while, a bulb would burn out, something like that. that day. <clears throat> and I got pretty well peeved about it. These, these lights could flare out. But, well, why the hell couldn't they flare out to me? Went on to Christmas time. I didn't go to the Christmas party. Went home. About 4 o'clock in the afternoon, my wife went out to distribute some gifts. And I had an office upstairs, and I went up to take a little inventory and to reminisce a little bit and check things over. And as I was going up the steps, it occurred to me that this was the first time since drinking had been a problem that I was reasonably happy and sober at the same time. And then I began to tear that thought apart. The doctor couldn't do that for me. My parents couldn't do it. My brothers and sisters couldn't. The clergy couldn't. Needless to say, I couldn't do it for myself. And I realized then that I must be receiving help from somewhere. And then some very familiar words flashed in my mind. Alcoholics Anonymous is a spiritual fellowship, and we get spiritual help to control our alcoholism if we live in such a way as to deserve it. Those are the words the man said at the hospital when I asked him to explain AA. And in a flash it came to me. My recovery, my recovery in itself, was a spiritual experience. And I had been having a spiritual experience from the very first, and I didn't know about it. <clears throat> it was a wonderful feeling. When I came into AA, I came in for sobriety and sobriety alone. But along with sobriety, I gained a new concept of God. My first concept of God I gained from a Sunday school leaflet. He was seated on a golden throne way off in the clouds, and the angels were playing harps all around. And that's about as close as I ever came to God. 
And so I come into A, and I've come to look upon God as a great power of good. And I have the feeling that I can be as near God as I deserve to be. And if I'm not as close to God tonight, today, as I was yesterday, or a week ago, or a month ago, I'm the one who's moved, because I've come to know that God is forever constant. And I never feel quite as near to God <clears throat> as I do when I go out on an AA call. If I were to ask God for a special favor right now, I couldn't think of anything finer to ask for than just the privilege of carrying the message of AA to those who need it up to my very last hour on this earth. Because then, and only then, will I know whether I made, really made this program. In addition to a new perspective... God, I gained a great faith in God, a greater faith than I was ever able to gain when I was a member of organized religion. And this faith, great faith, was a lasting faith. And I felt that I, uh, as I was living in a new world, things began to open up for me. And today, I like to look upon God as a great light. It shines across the pathway of life. All I have to do is face that light, and the shadow will fall back on me. It's as simple as that. Now, before I close, I want to turn back the pages of A history to the early days, just for a brief few moments. The days when we had just cause to fear that internal dissension, jealousy, dishonesty, what have intolerance would destroy A while it was yet in its cradle. When I came into the fellowship, we had no traditions, no established precedents for guidance. Every problem, every new problem we faced was necessarily solved by trial and error, and sometimes we came very nearly resorting to our fists. And that's not the accepted way of winning friends and influence friends winning people. I'm sure of that. We were immature, unstable, we argued for the sake of argument, and about the only thing we could agree upon was that there were two sides to every question, our side and the wrong side. <laughs> we uh, appointed committees to look after this, and we appointed committees to look after that, and then we appointed committees to look after the committees so we could find more things to fight about. <laughs> well, this unhappy state of affairs gave birth to the idea of establishing a universal code of standards or ethics which later became to came to be known as the traditions of twelve traditions of AA. And through strict adherence to these traditions, AA eventually <clears throat> the order emerged from chaos and we established unity, which is, which is essential to our progress, and there's no exaggeration to say that AA owes its very life to strict adherence to those traditions. And the longer I am in a in AA the more conscious I become of my individual responsibility of maintaining and conforming to those traditions so that the alcoholic of tomorrow will have the same chance for sobriety that I have today. Surely, that must be the <coughs> sacred obligation of every man or woman who has gained sobriety through the AA program. If Abraham Lincoln had been an AA, I think he would have spoken about our individual responsibility in a manner something like this. One score and nine years ago, our co-founders brought forth a new plan, conceived in love and service, and dedicated to the proposition that the alcoholic can be restored by the grace of God and the help of his fellow AAs. Today, we are engaged in a great humane effort to make that plan available to all who may be concerned. However, we cannot dedicate, we cannot consecrate, we cannot further that plan by mere word of mouth, but rather by assuming our individual responsibilities of personally carrying the message of AA to those who still suffer. The world will little note <clears throat> nor long remember who we are or what we are, well, what we do here will never be forgotten. It is for us who are willing and able to ever increase our efforts in this great field of endeavor without hope of gain, reward, or recognition. It is ours to carry the torch 
and to work with increased devotion to the unfinished task which lies before us. It is for us to highly resolve that this new way of life, granted by God, shall not have been given in vain, and that this fellowship of AA, by AA, and for AA shall not perish from this earth. Thank you. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.